Thank you so much, Adam, and it is so wonderful to be here and to take part in this really, really important gathering. We are all worried about climate, of course, and in much of the country and many places around the world, including California, where I just came from, people are worried about water. But I'd like to pause for a second and, and you know, take a little step back to think about what is it that we're worried about? This is a working definition of climate change. Do all of you know about the lexicon of sustainability? It's, it's a real, it, it's a, they do wonderful graphic and, and film clips of different aspects of sustainability, kind of um, under the idea of we can't really act on what we don't really know we're acting upon. So about clarifying ideas. So this was my contribution um, about my working definition of climate change. And Adam, I'd like your definition, your definition too. So this says, climate change is a symptom of disrupted carbon and water cycles. These cycles have been altered by such human activities as agriculture, deforestation, and the mining and burning of fossil fuels. But it's the first part that I want to really bring your attention to. And here is why I'm putting this out there. If we look at climate change solely from the perspective of CO2 levels, which, as Adam says, has been our way of dealing with it, and that's what we hear on the news when climate change is addressed, or in the, in the democratic debates, it's all about CO2 levels. There, but that leaves us helpless, because we know that even stopping completely fossil fuel emissions is not enough. However, if we take a slightly broader perspective and think in terms of the carbon and water cycles, we see that there is a great deal that we can do. Making that shift moves us away from anxiety, which is where we've been, and towards agency. And this, I believe, is a shift that we have to make for several re reasons. For one, that's the way that we can actually do something about the problems that worry us. And second, and not disconnected, is that's the way to engage people. Just, I'm so, I'm, I'm, I'm so struck by how talking about the problems and only the problems leaves people in despair, whereas talking about what we can do and what's hopeful engages people, and that's really exciting, and I think that we can go that way. Last year, at this group's first conference, we focused on the, the carbon cycle, how various practices, including holistic planned grazing and other forms of regenerative agriculture, take carbon in the atmosphere and bring it into the soil where it can be held over time. And while the carbon's in the soil, it does many other things. It bolsters the fertility of the land as well as land's capacity to hold water. This year, as Adam said, we're taking a, a, our lenses through the water cycle and the ways that water, climate, land health, land degradation, and biodiversity all connect. First, let's look at how we as a so society tend to talk about water. It tends to be that water is a static thing, as in there's this much water, this is what I get, this is what you get, and then, well, maybe we'll have to argue about that. When, it's, when we look at water in terms of how much we get, as in what comes down from the sky, whether there's enough rain or too much all at once, the impression is that we're at the mercy of the elements. All we can do is look to the sky to see what is or isn't coming down. And so the stories about water that are in the media and just kind of in the zeitgeist in general tend to be about scarcity, such as about water wars or how water is the new oil. Of course, water shortages are a real concern, but it's also worth thinking about how, oh, here's another one, okay, a little, word cloud about water and you know, the biggest one, the biggest words are conflict and war. So again, that kind of raises anxiety. It doesn't give you a sense of 
agency or a calm state of mind to think of, hmm, how else might we think about this situation? So it's worth thinking about whether a lack of fresh water is the problem that we're dealing with, as this indicates, or a symptom of the problem, which brings us back to that definition of climate change being a disruption of water and carbon cycles. So I would like to invite a different way of looking at water. Indeed, it is how many cultures have understood it, as water as process rather than water as thing, or another way to say it, at water as a verb as opposed to water as a noun. For by understanding how water functions and moves through the landscape, we can find many opportunities to restore ecosystems and bring natural cycles into balance. I've had the tremendous privilege of devoting this past year to meeting people who are working with the water cycle in innovative ways. And I'm going to share a bit of what I've learned. So we are now in Southern Africa, in Zimbabwe where at the Africa Center for Holistic Management, the Dimbengombe River, which this is, now flows year round, whereas it didn't before, and extends a full mile higher than it has in living memory. This despite many recent drought years. This was achieved through 10 to 15 years of holistic plan grazing, which brought back grasses and stopped erosions on the banks of that river. Increased carbon in the soil from, well, from, 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 the, from the way that the land was managed and mulch from livestock trampling down dead grasses has created the conditions so that rainfall is effective. It doesn't stream away, taking, natural, taking valuable nutrients with it. Among the first to benefit from the restoration of this river were the area's wild elephants. In the past, there had been just one permanent pool for the elephants to wallow in, which meant that they needed to travel long distances. Now, the elephants have many options for where to bathe and drink. The restored water cycle has brought back wildlife, including a higher density of lion than in the nearby Wangi National Park. This is what struck me when I was visiting Zimbabwe. I saw just in our you know, little drives around the area, we didn't really even have to go that far into the bush. Actually, on, on a walk that I took, I, I saw healthy herds of sable antelope with young. In most Southern African parks, including, including the Kruger Park in South Africa, sable populations are dwindling. And here at the Africa Center, they are thriving. I just think they're beautiful, so I'm always happy to show that slide. This is in Chihuahua, Mexico, where several holistic ranchers are working with bird conservation organizations to create habitat for endangered migratory grassland birds. In much of the region, the land is desertifying. In fact, in the Chihuahua region of Mexico, it's kind of a perfect storm because you have mismanaged land, ranch land that's desertifying, you have land that be because the ranchers are going out of business, Mennonite farmers that use real intensive agricultural practices, including so much in terms of chemical additives, are buying up the land and you know, di you know, plowing up the, the grasslands and putting all these chemicals in. And they have found oil and gas in the region. So, when I think of Chihuahua, I really am so aware of how this is land that is in the balance. Rancho, as, as we, we were traveling, rancho, rancher Alejandro Carrillo kept pointing to bare ground with a bit of mesquite and saying, this place used to have the best grass. Las Damas Ranch, shown here, is full of diverse perennial grasses, which makes it a magnet for birds. Here is worth highlighting the connection between water and biodiversity. It certainly makes sense that restoring the water cycle is good for biodiversity. I mean, that's, that's logical, okay? Because then the grasses are growing and the soil is working and, and all that. But we also come to understand that biodiversity supports a healthy water cycle. 
Birds help generate a diversity of grasses by carrying seeds and breaking open seeds with their beaks and a menagerie of creatures from prairie dogs to worms to dung beetles create pathways for water to linger in the landscape. This is just some typical eroded land. When I mentioned that Alejandro, this is Alejandro and his daughter, Daniela, and I mean, in traveling through the area, Alejandro was able to tell me what, you know, what's happened, what this was like now, what it's like now, what it was like 10 years ago, what it was like 30 years ago, and this is a typical piece where, place where there's been tremendous erosion and really not much happening on the ground. You can see so much bare ground. In order to address water needs and climate concerns, I believe that the public discussion needs to incorporate such concepts about the water cycle that you know we all kind of know about them from, from our science classes, but concepts as infiltration, surface evaporation, transpiration, and condensation. This summer, I traveled to far west Texas where Catherine and Marcus Otmers get most of the water they need from condensation. So here's Marcus at the water tank. He designed their rain barn so that the, okay, it was, it was really interesting. He said that his, his inspiration was the Namib, the Namib beetle that gets all of its drinking water from, from condensation and has this interesting way of doing so. So Marcus studied this and he, designed this barn so, so that there are two roofs, so that it, one roof really heats up, and then there's a differential, and there's also a means of airflow. So what was astounding to them is, you know, they knew that they were getting, they were getting some water from this, but one morning, this water tank overflowed. And Marcus's response was, this can't be happening because it hasn't rained in four months. So the next morning, he got up at, in, like at four in the morning to see what was actually happening. And indeed, the water was flowing into the tank from the roof. So, um, so this couple who, um, you know, Catherine and Marcus, they're really... In, they're really quite extraordinary. Um, they make their living primarily, well, this is not something I would recommend, through beehive removals. And their goal is to create an oasis in the desert centering on the use of dew. And yet, when we talk about our water problems, condensation doesn't really come up very often, but how much potential there is. So we also, they also have a ranch that they're working to develop. And these are some friends that we made on the ranch. While we went to the ranch, I thought this was also really interesting. Catherine noted how roads are de facto wrought water infrastructure, particularly in rural areas. She, noted, she pointed out a spot where the dirt road always floods. But had it been shaped, had it been angled a few degrees differently, it would have captured the water and therefore contributed to to the living ecosystem on that land. Here, as I mentioned, are some wild burrows. They were waiting for their turn to sit under the cottonwood, sh the, co the shade of the cottonwood tree. And it was July, and that cottonwood shade was some pretty, pretty valuable real estate on that day. But I just love the way that they were looking at us, you know, like if you're in a cafe and there's like, you know, like people are looking for empty tables, it was exactly that look. Catherine is, she, she's very philosophical about what they're doing. And as you saw from the picture, from the photo before, this is not like, you know, luxury, luxurious living, that, you know, living situation that they're in. I mean, they, they live in a FEMA trailer and then they work in the rain barn. Um, but I, I thought her philosophy was really interesting and it's worth saying. She says that there's no question that we're in the Anthropocene but that humans can be a force for good. She said, we can be the beavers in the landscape. And I know that we're gonna be hearing a lot about beavers, so, so thinking about how we can be the beavers in the landscape, that has a lot of, a lot of currency. 
These and other stories will be in my upcoming book, Water in Plain Sight, Hope for a Thirsty World, which will come out next July from St. Martin's Press. I'm really excited about the cover, and I wanted to share, share this with you, not just, you know, because it's like, you know, advertising and buy my book and all that, um, but I, because I think that the design is a teachable moment. It shows us that water is everywhere if we know how to look. So thank you very much.